Welcome everybody and uh, thank you for being here. My name is Fabi Reason. I'm the CEO of Pombia Motion. Uh, that's, uh, you saw the prototype there outside in the lobby from uh, early spring. So that's uh, the area where we are playing. And um, I, I'm here to share opportunities, learnings we did with virtual reality and simulators. So uh, quickly on uh, VR Motion itself, then uh, the system description. Nothing uh, too much technical, and uh, the challenges if we are introducing virtual reality in such a system. So uh, VR Motion uh, already started quite a while back, and um, uh, in 2014, first time we tried out that thing called virtual reality, where you wear glasses, Google glasses, uh, instead of having screens in front of you. 2015, a year later, we were able to make um, great um, uh, joint venture with uh, the HSR University, uh, which uh, brought us uh, a lot of engineer knowledge uh, to drive the technology forward. Then uh, in 2016, we started with uh, our first fly simulator with virtual reality and motions. Then uh, early this year, um, we had the pleasure to um, show the first prototype of a helicopter virtual reality motion simulator to Claude Vichard. I'm sure everyone knows Claude Vichard, the winner of the safety award this year, um, the Claude Vichard recovery procedure from the Vortex, everyone knows him. And uh, it was ama we were amazed that uh, Claude uh, Vichard was amazed uh, by himself with uh, the technology and how we could use the technology um, in safety area, in training area, uh, together with virtual reality, motions, and helicopter simulator. So that was the moment we decided uh, to split off separate path, uh, separate line. That's where also the color is changing to blue. So a bit away from our general mission. The general mission is building always with latest and greatest technology as most as possible realistic simulators <coughs> in all different areas. So if you see somewhere on the world the VR motion in green, that's mostly like the crazy things you see on the picture. If it's in blue, we are talking about the helicopter simulators. So on the timeline, if you see that, I mean, it's not, it's not a question if virtual reality is going to disrupt uh, the, the, the world, the technology. It's more the question when, based on the standards. And uh, it has taken us quite a long time to get used with this technology, and we are still working on it. However, the moment this uh, technology is working, everything goes far, far faster than uh, we are used in the previous world. So let me tell you why and how the description works. So first of all, the setup stays the same for every simulator. So there is a fly simulation, it has physics in it, and it moves the platform. There is a graphic engine which is rendering the visual uh, for the pilot to see in which direction the pilot is flying. Now, this part gets replaced by virtual reality glasses, goggles or whatever um, uh, type of words are in the meanwhile there. That's a small system change, and that small system change needs to be uh, fixed by what is called the motion compensation for VR system. I will come to, be, to, to that back a little bit later. On the motion part, it's also that if you are wearing glasses, um, the perception is a bit different. So, body is not acting same like um, uh, body is not acting same anymore, and it brought us in complete different ranges, different uh, styles. Uh, if you see the, the values here, this is something we, we kind of like were able to uh, make new approaches where you can successfully run high quality motion queuing algorithms on small dynamic platforms. Whilst maintaining the six degrees of freedoms, we now can operate the platform with a response time around 20 milliseconds. And uh, electrical motors, and it fits easily into places. You can even have one in your living room at home. On the simulation itself, 
the one we are uh, using here, um, we made a bit a different approach because virtual reality. So uh, we have a physics simulation which is pretty dynamic and pretty fast. It runs at one kilohertz. Um, all the motion behaviors, all the control loading information is directly rendered out of the physics simulation. It's ind independent from the visual frame rate. And uh, on the graphic engine, we are running for, we, we have to run it for virtual reality at 90 frames per second, which is not common in that world. On uh, displays, uh, you see, just to compare it on a 4K, it runs around 120 frames per second. And that's the area where we are ending up, I would say, a bit in a new world, like the little, little volumeter, how it is called. Um, I mean, this is, uh, this is now directly simulated in real time. Uh, for example, um, uh, those special emergency situations, they now work out of the box. Uh, what you're seeing here is my colleague Christoph uh, just trying out the low G on an R22. In virtual reality, I mean, yes, you get the total immersive environment. You really can dive into it. You lose everything what's around you. Um, and uh, for those who never tried it out, um, it's very simple. We increase the field of view. That can be done by adding more and more monitors. And adding more and more monitors gives you the possibility to watch around in an aircraft, in a helicopter, or whatever. That can be done with uh, displays as well. That can even be done by projecting in domes. Now, the moment where virtual reality kicks in is that the person sitting in that um, world can start moving the head and moves in the three-dimensional room. So, uh, for example, watching down where um, the landing direction is pointing to uh, bring down the aircraft in the right direction. However, even if it is having so nice um, opportunities, virtual reality brings a lot of challenges. I want to share uh, four um, main challenges we've been dealing with, and um, uh, also the way how we approach them to solve it. The very first one is what I've mentioned before the motion compensation. Think about, if you are wearing glasses, the computer needs to know if the pilot watches up, that, it sees, that the pilot sees the overhead display. That said, the head needs to be tracked. Watching on the right side, the pilot should get the picture from the right side. Think about, if you are moving that system tracking the head on a motion platform, the computer doesn't know anymore whether it, the pilot is moving the head or the whole motion platform is moving. That needs to be compensated, and it can be compensated. The technical challenge is it needs to be very exact on each picture. Otherwise, the pilot will get sick. Another part is the cockpit work. So uh, whilst seeing the nice cockpit in the three-dimensional view, um, it's not there anymore to operate. And I'm sure you saw a lot of YouTube movies already how to, uh, how to manipulate the switches. Myself, as just a little fixed wing private pilot, I'm used to change the radio and then watching outside. That's not working if you need to do this in the air somewhere. And the way we are solving is this, uh, that we just take the 3D model, print it out in a pretty cheap way, so the pilot has all the haptics, and we are tracking fingers, we are tracking uh, already the head, so we know exactly where the pilot is, and we can even uh, show afterwards the hands and uh, arms and uh, the position where the pilot is and manipulate in a pretty cheap way the cockpit. There are different solutions to it. It could be with gloves. There are also other solutions. Now think about uh, multi-crew training. That person now wears glasses and doesn't see the other person on the other side. That's not a problem at all, because with the technologies by today, this can be combined as well. I'm not going to show you the multi-crew training, how we addressed it in um, the helicopter. It's uh, subject to research, but I want to show you a small example from another project 
So what you see here is, here you see two uh, simulations combined. So the guy on the left side is um, uh, driving the white car, the guy on the right side is driving the black car. And uh, you see uh, they interacting with each other. And uh, given that we are tracking already the position from in virtual reality from every person, it's not a big deal uh, to combine those things. So on the motion sickness, we do have on the motion sickness we do have um, those types. So everyone having kids like myself at home, um, they always feel good regardless if they are wearing the virtual reality glasses. And like my mom, always sick if she needs to wear, wear the virtual glasses. And there are people which will get used to. And uh, there are a lot of tricks because uh, the body feels different. I mean, uh, there are tricks like reducing the field of view the moment the, the head is twisted. So um, if, you, if you move your head to the right and left, there are possibilities to start adding body parts like a virtual nose. And uh, one very important thing is, and you will realize it if you are disabling the hands, out of a sudden, a very well-educated and professional helicopter pilot starts to make movements like this. If you are re-adding the hands and seeing it, it goes back in those few millimeters movement. Then uh, also one part is uh, the haptic and not, not touching the cockpit anymore. Think about it, in the virtual reality, you see everything and you want to put your arm wrist there and you disappear somewhere in nothing. It's going to be uh, quite emotional if this happens a couple of times. Uh, the body adrenaline increases and you may get sick as well. One technical challenge, the frame rate with virtual reality needs to maintain 90 frames per second. Um, if, if you go below 60 frames per second, uh, people start getting sick. Then the field of view is another challenge. So field of view, like everyone sees, around 180 degrees. And uh, if you are reducing the field of view, it's like uh, not so good anymore because out of a sudden the pilot needs to move the head to see the full range. Uh, the current uh, on-the-shelf uh, glasses, they are around 110 degrees. That's what you have outside on the prototype. Uh, but we uh, already have a lot um, other products uh, ready for Christmas, um, which are really reaching the ranges which are needed. So there is also the resolution part. I mean, uh, to, to read the instruments, it's not enough with what you get from the shelf. It needs to go far higher. Think about now maintaining the frame rate with this high resolution. It's going to be even more challenging. Um, that said, this fight, uh, often we have to, to uh, start turning off features, effects, and we are back on a good old picture everyone is aware of. However, with um, uh, technologies by today, uh, we can render it up without problems on a frame rate, 90 frames per second, on 8K, and uh, keep the nice visual like it is. Then, one of the most common topic, the motion sickness itself. I'm sure everyone already knows this person. <coughs> He's uh, from the Oculus uh, glasses, the CTO, and uh, describes the motion sickness in a way which is somehow like a mismatch between what you see and what you feel. And uh, it's basically the opposite. Everyone is aware of reading a book in a car. You don't see it moving, but you feel it, or sitting in a closed room on a boat. And uh, if you are adding there and combining this virtual reality with existing systems, it, this issue can be compensated. So uh, this can be compensated by um, um, running high-quality motion queuing, which is uh, really adopted for a dynamic platform. And uh, the challenges there, the uh, physics needs to be quite fast so that we know where it's moving. As well, the uh, challenge is that the response time from the platform, as well, angular velocity needs to be pretty fast. 
What we are having outside is um, the prototype from last spring, uh, already a historical thing. I encourage you to have a, have a look in which direction it is going. <laughs> Before I'm ending here, where do we run ahead with this? And I think uh, it perfectly fits what we heard before. I mean, just already in the basic training, what you see here is a student never being in a helicopter before who just got trained on the simulator prototype and uh, is doing his first takeoff and hoover exercise. Doesn't look super professional yet, but keeping in mind that this person um, didn't have any school, flight school uh, hours, it's not so bad. Then a special operation, think about the multi-crew work. Why can't this person have also VR Googles standing in a different room and combining it? Safety trainings, I mean, no doubts, as soon the, <coughs> the vehicle, the simulator works realistic, it's not a problem anymore to train those things in an immersed environment. Scenario-based trainings, and how could it be different, being from Switzerland, the mountain flying techniques. Closing, introducing the virtual reality systems um, makes it possible. It needs, uh, it needs pretty good uh, graphic, high, high frame rates. Um, it needs uh, possibilities to make the cockpit work, multi-crew work possible. And uh, it also needs a very dynamic platform with um, uh, special motion queuing algorithms. And of course, the whole system needs to work end to end uh, together. And we are sure with this approach that this will be a great opportunity to com uh, contribute to the helicopter safety. With all of that, I'm giving back in the studio and uh, looking forward to meet you outside in the lobby or during the evening for some simulator sessions. Thanks a lot. <laughs>